if you're thinking about flying a drone or you already fly one here in the UK and you are what we call a recreational flyer, so you don't fly for work, then you're probably flying something like this, a sub 250 gram camera drone. Although heavier drones like this DJI Air 3 might give you a better picture and handle things like windy conditions better. Flying a sub 250 gram drone in the UK is by far the simplest option available to most people, particularly recreationally in the open category. There really isn't a more simple way of flying a drone right now amidst what are fairly complex rules. Hundreds of thousands of you have watched our UK drone rule videos and with 2024 starting, we thought an update would be handy. So today we'll be running through everything you need to know to fly a sub 250 gram drone in the UK. This video assumes that you're flying a camera drone with a takeoff weight of less than 250 grams. If you need this same info for heavier drones, there are videos on this channel explaining the rules. This information is correct as of January 2024 and focuses on the rules in place today and not the proposed rule changes coming in 2026 and beyond. If you want a deeper dive on that type of content then the good news is is that there's plenty of other videos on this channel doing just that. This feels like a good time to ask you to subscribe if you're new here and if my regulars wouldn't mind hitting that like I would really appreciate it. You'll get more drone advice videos and the latest drone news. The objective of this video is to help you fly your sub 250 gram drone with confidence and enjoy what is a fantastic hobby or get the most out of your flying camera. Today we'll be breaking things down into simple sections, registration, airspace, a bit of a focus on visual line of sight and even a few bonus tips. This isn't going to be particularly heavy going, actually flying a sub 250 gram drone in the UK gives you a fair amount of freedom and why not because we are talking about a very lightweight drone here aren't we? So first up we need to look at registration. The UK CAA, so the people who regulate everything from little Cessnas flying through to the airliners that take us on holiday all the way through to space travel from UK soil are the same regulator who oversee the tiny consumer drones we fly. So there's a little bit of aviation jargon and alike that you need to get used to but it is all pretty simple once you do so. In the UK drone registration isn't really about the drone itself. In fact you can register that with the system without even owning a drone. You don't need the serial numbers or anything like that at all. That is because the UK CAA Drone and Model Aircraft Registration and Education Scheme, or DIMARES for short, is actually more about registering you than any particular drone. There are two parts to the DIMARES scheme. Firstly, the operator ID. This is the part where you pay a yearly fee of around £10. This goes up every so often with charge reviews, etc. So check the CAA site linked in the description. Also, whilst we mention that, the only place you can register is on the official CAA website. If you're a member of of the BMFA or FPV UK, you can also register through your membership there. Signing up for an operator ID will give you a unique number. This number is the one that you're expected to display on any drones that you own, regardless of who is actually flying the drone. The operator ID is essentially you confirming that you are the person or organization responsible for the drone in legal terms. I recommend that you place the number on a label rather than writing it on the drone itself. The operator ID needs to be renewed each year and you will often find for various reasons that you're given a new number. The other part of the drone registration scheme Demares is the flyer ID. You do not need to have this to fly sub 250 gram drones in the UK but I'm going to explain it anyway for a reason that will become more obvious. The flyer ID is a multiple choice quiz which when you pass gives you another unique number. This essentially means you are confirming that you know the basics of the rules. The unique number your flyer ID does not need to be placed on the drone but there are certain in circumstances where you will need to produce this to some authorities. Although you do not need this at the moment, I would recommend that you take the test and learn the information. It will help you in terms of understanding the rules. The test is not complicated and all the answers are actually within the CAA drone code website itself. It is more really about knowledge. In terms of your competence as a drone flyer in the UK, there is one more step you need to take as stipulated by legislation. It will sound a little bit weird, a little bit basic, but there's a good reason for it. The other step you need to take is read the manual. This sounds simple enough and many of us will often skip the manual when opening up our new tech. 
But when it comes to consumer drones, there's actually a lot of information in the manual to help make your flight safer and make sure you get your flying camera back in one piece. It will include essential information on things like return to home functions, obstacle avoidance, a host of other information you really do need to know when flying a drone. Next up, and we need to talk about airspace. All drones flying in the UK must adhere to flight restrictions and it is essential you understand your responsibility in this area. If you look at the people who are actually getting in trouble at the moment, so the people who are being fined and ending up in court, it's normally because they are flying, or one of the principal reasons they'll be there, is because they are flying in the wrong place. Think of drone airspace in terms of two sections. What is happening on the ground and then airspace clearance. Flying in the UK as a recreational drone pilot, you will be flying in what is called the open category. This is actually more about where you are flying in terms of town centre or countryside and how close you can get to uninvolved people, etc. There are three subcategories within the open category. A3 means countryside flying far from people and without further certification. You can actually fly much heavier drones here. The next subcategory is the A2 airspace, which is flying closer to people, 50 metres really. But this is a little bit defunct at the moment and not really applicable for sub 250 gram drones. There is a special mention in the bonus points relating to the A2 subcategory, but we'll move on to the main event, which is the A1 airspace. If you want to fly in town centers or even over uninvolved people, then a sub 250 gram drone will allow you to do that without any extra certification whatsoever. So you're able to fly in town centers or congested areas as the regulator likes to call them. As mentioned, you can fly over people, but you need to avoid groups or crowds of people. There is zero separation required in terms of uninvolved people with your sub 250. Basically, the advice here is to avoid any situation where someone cannot move out of the way easily. The CAA have got a list of suggested locations and scenarios that they recommend you avoid, but for me, you could even include people sat enjoying a picnic at a park. You need to ensure you operate within these parameters safely, so run a mental risk assessment of the location and make sure you feel like a drone flight is safe or even appropriate. Remember, when flying a drone, it is your responsibility to do so safely. You could be flying within the rules and still be deemed as operating unsafely. So think about the flight before takeoff, especially when you're close to people. Planning is everything. Assess the area of your flight and try to preempt any issues that might come up. We have a video coming up on congested area flying tips. So if you want a deeper dive into that topic, Keep an eye out on the channel for that one. And if you're new here, hit the subscribe button so YouTube sends you that video. So as you can see, the first part of airspace here, talking about the open category and the subcategories of it, is more actually talking about where you can fly in terms of what's going on on the ground rather than even necessarily the airspace. However, this freedom and discussion in terms of airspace can lead people to believe incorrectly that sub 250 gram drones are some kind of outlaw drone and can pretty much fly anywhere. In fact, the truth is that all drones must follow the same airspace restrictions. There is no extra benefit at all in terms of flying a sub 250 gram drone. You still need to carry out all the checks to make sure you are clear to fly. This includes things like avoiding airport exclusion zones and checking whether or not there are any other temporary or permanent restrictions to the airspace. These could be in place for a number of safety reasons and flying your drone into one is a very serious issue that you can expect a swift response from authorities over. My top tip here is to download an app called Drone Assist, which will give you all sorts of information, including whether or not there are any temporary restrictions at a glance. We've got a video talking you through how to use that app, which I will link to in the description. I really cannot stress enough how important it is to get the airspace clearance right. Thanks to apps and services like Drone Assist and Drone Scene, it's easier than ever before to quickly check your flight is legal. Flying in a restricted area will get you in serious trouble and could threaten the safety of other flights and events. Moving on, and we need to talk about visual line of sight, a fun one here. As this is one of the most debated and important parts of recreational drone flights, we'll be focusing on this topic a little bit in this video. This rule means you need to keep your drone within your direct line of sight at all times. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be looking at the drone the entire time. There's essential information displayed on the app that you need to observe, and it's important you are scanning the surrounding airspace for obstacles and other aircraft. Visual line of sight means should you look to where your drone is in the sky, then you can clearly see it. This is one of the areas where there is a little confusion at the moment. And to help cut through this, I've actually created the VLOS traffic lights. Red light 
is the legislation and means jumping through it will get you in trouble and you will likely be breaching the legislation. Amber light is the legislation line in the sand and our green light for VLOS is the CAA's own guidance. So we'll explain green light to red. So if you want to play it very safe, you can follow the CAA acceptable means of compliance. As this suggests, it is the distance you can fly your drone from you and the controller and be deemed to be automatically legal. For this to happen, the CAA states that you need to keep the drone close enough that you're able to tell the drone's orientation in the sky without relying on the camera feed at all, the app information or the lights alone. Simply by looking at the drone in the sky, you will need to be able to tell which direction it is facing. That is fairly extreme when you consider that with a small drone like the DJI Minis, you'll probably need to keep it within about 90 meters of your position. In my opinion, this is good advice to follow if you are a very new drone flyer and want complete confidence that what you're doing is completely safe and legal. However, as you fly more and become more confident, you may want to go outside of those CAA recommendations and fly more to the legislation. It doesn't mean you're breaking the law and it's where I would deem is the amber light of my traffic light system of VLOS. We do have a VLOS video where I go into more detail on flying beyond the CAA guidance, which of course is linked in the description. But as a brief explanation for this video, the legislation itself states Visual line of sight operation means a type of operation in which the remote pilot is able to maintain continuous unaided visual contact with the unmanned aircraft, allowing the remote pilot to control the flight path of the unmanned aircraft in relation to other aircraft, people and obstacles for the purpose of avoiding collisions. So in terms of keeping within this legislation, and remember, if you fly this way, then you might find yourself explaining all this to a court or police officer. But in my opinion and experience, you can certainly fly beyond the distance the CAA guidance discusses while still being able to stick within the legislation. Just remember that you need to ensure that you can still clearly see your drone. What else is happening in the sky around it, but also what is happening on the ground, for instance, in case you need to suddenly land. So although flying like this is acceptable in my opinion, and you remain within the amber traffic light zone, it would be easy to stray into the red light stop area or visual line of sight by going too far out that you cannot see what is happening on the ground around the drone. Remember, this cannot be what you see on your drone's camera feed, but instead what you or your spotter can see with your eyes alone from your position. Flying beyond visual line of sight is one of the areas where most prosecutions of small drone flyers are centered around. So keep this in mind and remember, there is a deeper dive into VLOS in a video linked in the description. One exception to the visual line of sight is covered by point 35 of the drone code, flying with follow me active. It states that some drones have a follow me mode that means you can set your aircraft to follow you within a fixed distance. You do not have to keep your drone in direct sight when follow me mode is active and set to follow you within 50 meters. You must still follow all other points of the drone code. So make sure you are very confident the drone isn't going to hit anyone. And my personal advice is to not rely on things like obstacle avoidance to dodge people nearby. This could be a very useful exception to get some great shots of you walking off into that sunset. As you might expect, the red light for VLOS is reserved for flying your drone beyond visual line of sight. There is so much debate about what this actually means, but just remember that you will not have a YouTuber sat next to you in court and you need to make a decision on VLOS which falls within the legislation and your own skills and comfort zone. This next part of the UK drone rules is actually something fairly simple and I think actually most people know this even if you're not actually a current drone user. That is how high you can fly your drone. It is 120 meters or 400 feet. I know it triggers me too that 120 meters isn't actually 400 feet, but enough of that. The same is true with the height of your drone flight as with VLOS. No one's waiting, hanging over your shoulder to imprison you if you fly a foot or two out of the way. Frankly, it's unlikely also that you'll even spend that much time at that height with a sub 250 gram drone due to things like winds and staying close to your subject matter. Take into account the 120 meters is from the Earth's surface. So that doesn't mean your takeoff position. It means the drone's position in relation to the closest point to the earth. So if you're flying around hills, etc., you'll need to adjust as required. Flying off a cliff means that your, your drone could instantly stray into becoming an illegal flight. Remember as well that the telemetry on your drone app isn't foolproof and you need to assess for yourself 
what might be impacting things. The drone will take its height in the software from your takeoff position and will not automatically adjust for sudden changes in the ground level below it. One part of the air navigation order, which is Article 241, basically talks about flying your aircraft and making sure that you don't endanger other aircraft, people, that type of thing. It's actually something which is a catch-all article within the air navigation order and something a lot of people forget don't. Remember, you could be flying sub 400 feet within visual line of sight following all sorts of rules, but still your flight could actually be dangerous or unsafe under Article 241. Another area people can fall foul of is adding weight to your sub 250 gram drone and not realizing this removes the benefits of flying in congested areas and over people. If you add things like ND filters, heavy wraps, strobe lights, landing gear, any of the many accessories available for drones like the mini drones, you could increase your takeoff weight over the 250 gram mark. Remember, it is the weight of your drone at takeoff that counts. So just be aware. This is a good point for the extra A2 airspace shout out that I promised before. The A2 airspace is pretty much a dead concept and allows you to fly in congested areas with heavier drones, but you've got to stay 50 meters horizontally away from uninvolved people. It's a long story, but due to changes, the A2 subcategory nearly really achieved what it was intended for. However, there are a couple of benefits to anyone who wants to take an A2 CFC or certificate of competency. You can take a simple video course with a CAA recognized training company, pass an exam, and then you can fly drones up to 500 grams in the A1 airspace just without intentional flights over people. So if you've added lights, etc., as mentioned before, an A2 CFC could be a great way to keep flying your small drone in congested areas with zero separation of uninvolved people. Next up, a few bonus tips and points to help you get the most out of flying your sub 250 gram drone with confidence. Firstly, always carry out pre and post flight checks of your drone. You might be surprised how contact with bugs and debris can damage your props and the arms of your drone, especially over time. So check regularly that everything is in working order and correct. Replace your props at any sign of wear and tear to avoid a much more expensive issue if they fail during flight. When flying your drone, keep a keen ear and eye out for emergency service helicopters, such as the air ambulances. They will approach very quickly and will have to halt their flight or take evasive action to avoid your drone. If this does happen, my advice is to firstly hover your drone in place, assess what action should be taken, often including dropping height or landing where the drone is, but hover and assess first. It's one of the areas that shows why visual line of sight is so important. Don't let the weather catch you and your small drone out. Remember, it is not rated to fly in anything other than dry conditions. So be aware that fog, mist or rain could cause the drone to fail or act erratically. With cheap consumer drones, you're playing a lottery in terms of moisture ingress and whether or not it might cause an issue. Issues might not even happen straight away with the moisture causing issues over time. Don't fly your consumer rated drones in the rain unless you want issues essentially. There you have the main rules you need to know to fly your sub 250 gram drone in the UK as a hobbyist. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Remember to please give this video a like and if you're new here, hit the subscribe button. Sean out.